I can hear you. Oh, well, then I'm not at fault. Uh, so, David, guess what I dispute? Okay, now, in all seriousness, how few things have I ever discovered since I'm not a researcher? Um, well, at least three. I can think of two and a third today, but what are the three that you can think of? Uh, let me take the easy one. I'm the person in the world who figured out who shot down Joe Kennedy Jr., and that's not a boastful statement. It was an accident by Googling. Can you think of anything else, David? I can. I'm just casting around in my memory for which was the most valuable. Oh, well, which one? Well, just why don't you blurt them both out or however many you have while I try to get back to the chat room. Well, it sounds very subtle, but in my opinion, you discovered that your sister was in Chicago in 1966, which is, from my point of view, exceedingly important. Yes, and she was there from the end of May until mid-July. Right. And I think she was recruited, not as I had at first thought at Hull House, but actually at the Sheraton Hotel. But uh, that's two. Okay, can you think of it? No, 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 me... no pressure. I'm not saying there is anything. I can't think of anything that I've discovered because I don't... If, if one were just to take a critical look at today's radio show ad, what I do is I start out with one or two images, uh, and then as I'm uploading images, and I'll tell you, we happen to be extremely fortunate to have Craig Peterson in our camp. Look at these images he made. And uh, you know what? I wonder if Craig's here. Let me just check if he's here before I tell you what I discovered today, David. And uh, it's critical. Uh, what's his name? Craig. That's K. No, Craig. Okay, so I'll, because uh, Craig will probably want to, he'll probably want to make a card like this for Operation Hot Kitchen, which is currently scheduled to occur over the weekend of 31 July to 2 August, but uh, credit for credit too, especially if the creditable party is here, which she is. There's a woman in England, woman, woman. Anyway, that's uh, Gary Puckett before his voice faded. Uh, 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 yeah, a young lady, younger than me, young lady in England sent me the most gripping YouTube I've seen in, oh, I'd say five years, other than the YouTubes that Craig puts out, which are excellent. Have you ever heard of the name of uh, Commander Gerald Holding? I think I got that name right, of Hailing Island, uh, UK. No. Well, we got another murder solved. Uh, he was murdered by his own troops. He was the uh, small boat unit commander who made more insertions and unobserved landings um, in small special boats. He would leave Hailing Island down by Portsmouth and he would go across the channel, extract a very critical people. Uh, and he's, he got a DSO, I think that's what it's called over in England. Does that sound right to you, a Distinguished Service Order? Yeah, a Distinguished Service Order. Okay. Yeah, he was awarded one of those in 1941. And for the Americans and Canadians, keep in mind that uh, World War II started in 39 for Europe, and the uh, United States didn't get sucker punched in by Lord Mountbatten until December 7th of 41. Now, of course, Lord Mountbatten got knocked off early, too. Uh, it seems like some people know too much. That's why I act stupid on occasion. Uh, they, they can't believe that David and I are doing this alone. At least my sister can't believe because she's a, uh, what is she, a belligerent bovine. Okay. Anyway, David, um, guess why this superhero of World War II had to be killed in 1945? Because had he lived, he would have exposed the path that leads to the corrupted role of the Marines. Not exactly. Had he lived, he told his wife in his last letter, I think her name was Edna, in his last, what people in the old days called love letters. Now, I don't know if anybody loves anybody anymore, but there's some very nice people out there uh, still. 
Uh, but as far as love letters, oh, wait a minute, yeah. I guess I know for sure that that still goes on. I'll keep that to myself, I think. In his last love letter to his wife, and watch how quickly somebody might be able to produce this, and I, I'm thinking the guy's name is Commander Gerald Holding, H-O-U-L-D-I-N-G, Royal Navy. Um, he said to his wife, when I get out of this hospital, gee, they keep sending guys to hospitals to kill them. The flight attendant on Ron Brown's uh, ill-fated jet that needed to die so they didn't expose Hillary. Uh, a guy named Ed Boyd Graves. Uh, after Burger, would you mind Ed? Or is it Boyd Ed Graves? It's either E-D-B-O-Y-D -E Graves, like where you put dead people. It's either Ed Boyd Graves or Boyd Ed Graves. Uh, they killed him in a U.S. Navy hospital because he tracked down the CIA U.S. government patent on HIV uh, AIDS. Here we get, uh, finally, I get to the destination. The reason why the commander of the small boat unit had to be done away with was uh, just like when Pat Tillman told an embedded journalist that he was going to become the biggest anti-war activist the United States had ever seen, I've taken over. Sorry, Pat. Anyway, they killed Pat Tillman with three rounds to the forehead. Well, this, this uh, commander of the small boat unit, he said in a letter to his wife, and he probably should have not put it in writing, uh, when I get out of the hospital, I'm going to, oh, as you like to say, David, wait for it. When I get out of the hospital, I'm going to write an article on Cameron. David, where have we heard the name Cameron? Well, uh, the phony baloney guy at the Billingdon Club, right? Yes, and his uh, one of his grandparents I was looking at today, uh, his patern no, his maternal grandfather was in the army, uh, and I believe that Cameron was a code word for the other guy. I don't know that, but I do know that his grandfather came over to the U.S. and raped Chicago, literally, grain and something else. Uh, I can't remember what he was in. He was in two industries, grain being one. But uh, Alexander Geddes, if I'm not getting my wires crossed, G-E-D-D-E-S, I think I just got the part that I asked for from Denise C. Let's just find out. Uh, yes, David, take a look at what just popped up between uh, above Swamp R and it appeared uh, uh, courtesy of Denise C. in the United Kingdom. I got a flag in John Ainsworth, that's right? Yeah, John Ainsworth Davis, I believe, uh, was a bad guy. But uh, did you know that there was an Operation James Bond back then in World War II? No, I didn't. Okay, do you, this is really funny. It's not funny at all. It's it's God. But do you remember how in the last radio show ad, I think, and uh, Swamper Mama, if you're back from making your egg salad sandwiches, maybe Swamper Mama could go to Wednesday's show ad or the transcript. I think I had a comment in the Wednesday show that James Bond was fiction and Agent Chips is fact. Uh, anybody remember that? But I want to thank Denise for that uh, that wonderful YouTube because until this morning, uh, I'd never heard of this guy, and yet he's another uh, military person that knows too much to survive. Well, kiss my grits. Over to you, David. Okay, Phil. Well, I, I was thinking about the third um, thing that you uniquely came upon, and you did this indirectly. Because, but for you, no one, including me, I think, would have paid attention to where the Marines are placed on, or were placed, and I believe continue to this day, between officers and unruly men on ships in the War of 1812, where the United States and the Brits went to war with each other. Now, I would, I would, it would never have occurred to me, but for you, the importance of that, because 
just remind the listeners why you think that Obama has disarmed the Marines in or during inauguration parades, etc. Why do you think that's so? He knows that uh, anybody who's taken an oath to defend the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, would be uh, it would be their duty to arrest Barry Swatero, Punahou 79. Uh, the U.S. Naval Academy came into existence in 1841. I'm not sure when they first marched in the inauguration parade, but uh, I marched in one, and let me think of it, it was Nixon. Uh, yeah, January 20th, I believe. And by the way, oh, if anybody, like if anybody, say, in England who knows me, like Afterburner, uh, VP, Doug McNichol, Liberish Peasant, Dennis, there I said it again, Denise Clark, or Sarah Allen, if any of those seven people, or if Mike Robinson or Brian Garish happen to get wind of this, if any of those seven people remind me, I will bring in an inauguration no parking sign from January 20th of 1969 when I marched in the parade and so did uh, Ginger Cookie. We didn't know each other. In fact, we've never met to this day. Uh, she's a librarian retired up in Bangor, Maine, and, I, and I'm me. Um, I marched in the parade as a Naval Academy midshipman, a junior, and I'm here to tell you that because of the unpopular war in Vietnam, uh, a Naval officer got up in front of 4,000 of us young men and said, uh, we want you guys to be absolutely professional as you're marching. And there's an expression in the military, keep your eyes in the boat. That means don't be looking around to the peripherals. Just keep your eyes straight ahead. It's a sign of discipline. And uh, after the Navy guy got on and told us or got on and said, but in the event of any attack by draft dodging people that are opposed to the war in Vietnam, remember that we have fixed bayonets. Note to self, I'm going to go back after this show, if I can do it, I think I can, and put a comment in about fixed bayonets. Okay, anyway, in the history of Naval Academy midshipmen, it's actually called the brigade. It's everybody who's physically capable of marching. They march um, every four years when a new hose bag pretends to be the duly elected president. Um, Never in the history of the United States Naval Academy have they not had fixed bayonets until Barry Swatero, Punahou 79, who got his U.S. passport from my system, it's M-A-B-U-S, and uh, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General Joseph, I think his middle name might be L, um, Dunford, I sent them an email yesterday, and if anybody has it, I hope you can post it. Um, I basically pussyfooted around the treason word. David, over to you. Okay, Phil. Well, I've got this guy identified as Jervis, right, who was a stern disciplinarian, and I'm going to read something or three paragraphs from Wikipedia about this role that this guy played in preventing mutinous. Jervis had the reputation as a disciplinarian and put in place a new system that would ensure that the men in the Mediterranean fleet did not mutiny. To begin with, the Admiral wrote a new set of standing orders. For example, Jervis divided the seamen and marines and berthed the two separately, putting the marines between the officers aft and the men forward. Thus, he created an effective barrier between officers and potentially unruly crews. Jervis discovered, com discouraged conversation in Irish, though he did not ban it. He ordered the marine detachments to be paraded every morning, and if there was a band available for God Save the Queen, to be the King to be played. The marine, and I think this is absolutely vital in respect of what we need to do to turn the United States Republic around. The marine detachment was then to remain armed at all times. 
Marines and soldiers were also excused from duties in regarding to the general running of the ship, and it is a gesture of extreme, extreme contempt, in my humble opinion, that Barry Spatero should force a Marine to hold an umbrella over his plug-ugly head and protect it from the drip of nature when he's one himself. In order to keep his crews active and to ensure that the Spanish did not perceive that there might be discontent in the fleet, Jervis ordered the nightly bombardment of Cadiz, in his own words to, three very important words, divert the animal. The Admiral isolated the ships from one another to minimize collusion and the opportunities the men might have to band together in mutiny. St. Vincent did ensure, however, that the men under his command were cared for. When the stock of tobacco ran low, the Admiral ensured that the supply was renewed from his own funds. When the postmaster in Lisbon detained the letters and packets arriving from England for the men for fear that they would carry seditious communications, this is very interesting, Jervis set up an office aboard his flagship HMS Ville de Paris to receive and distribute all the letters that arrived for both seamen, marines and officers. He strictly adhered and accepted to the Articles of War. Now, there's a guy dating back to, let me get a date here, when he was, um, what his dates were. Maybe some people in the chat room could flesh out this character. I think he's a marvelous role model for what needs to be done in the United States of America by Marine General Joseph Dunford, if he's capable of it and if he's not a crook. He, he, he is not capable and he is a crook, but keep going. Okay, so Admiral of the Fleet John Jervis, 1st Earl of St. Vincent, GCBPC, Privy Council, he lived from 9th of January 1735 to the 14th of March 1823. So he was alive in the 1812 war when, is it James Madison was uh, authorizing letters of mark and reprisal for American ships to attack British ships? Is, uh, is that the man's name, the President of the United States in the 1812 war with Britain? I don't know, but uh, Swamper Mama or Afterburner or Denise C.U.K. or let's see, let's see uh, some guy. Oh, George Holdsworth. Uh, I don't know if, what's his name? And I'm not being disrespectful. I, oh, Jake R. from Kansas. He's pretty quick on the draw, too. David, I hear you kissing the ass of this Jervis. Guess what? Go ahead. You can't see it, but I, while you were talking about true leadership uh, and caring for men, I went over and I got a silver tail hook that's mounted on a plaque, and it has been mounted on this plaque since sometime in April of 1977. And what the tradition with the silver tail hook is, is the enlisted force of a U.S. Navy squadron um, is compelled to pretend like they like their commanding officer. And when the commanding officer is uh, rotated out of his command seat at the squadron, in this case, uh, I was at VT-25, and you can't make this stuff up, at NAS, Naval Air Space and Chase Field, in Beeville, Texas, where today there is the McConnell unit of the Texas State Prison. David, what I'm showing the people at Livestream is a plaque and a silver tail hook, and it was given to me, and I was not a commanding officer. I was a cunning linguist, and I had a very good rapport with the enlisted men for two reasons. Number one, it's only correct to treat everyone like you're equal because we are, in fact, all equal. I can't equal your research and you can't equal my confusing way to tell the truth. Uh, however, the, the fact that the enlisted men gave me that is a direct tribute not to me but to my father because in November of 1961, my father pointed at the black person who just put us on a roller coaster for free, no tickets, the young black man said, that's okay, Colonel, this one's on me. And he gave us a free roller coaster ride. I asked my dad after we got out of your shop, I said, how did that, 
guy working at the amusement park, <clears throat> how did he know you're in the Air Force? And my father said, uh, Field, the truth is, the guy is my crew chief on my T-33 at Westover Air Force Base. And the reality is that the enlisted forces of the military aren't paid enough to where they can provide for a family. So generally, the enlisted forces have to have their wife work. And this was back in the time when and wives working started in World War II. Uh, this was only 1961, 16 years after World War II. And not, not most wives were working back then. Uh, most were not, as I recall. And I have pretty good recall. Anyway, so my father uh, respected enlisted men, and he taught me to do that. And guess what? I do. And that's why I challenge these four-star failures to vacate their offices or, or uh, face charges. And by the way, whenever I need to get a little energy, I prefer Cavendish and Harvey mixed fruit drops. Oh, there's still some there. I'll put one on my tongue later. So, David, here's some guys that have missed. There's 30 flag officers that I'm aware of that have committed treason. Uh, and you know, I'll just, I'm not saying that the following names are people that I believe have committed treason, but I am going to try to see how many four-star failures I can remember. Uh, Abizad, that's West Point 73. Cody, West Point 72. Petraeus, West Point 74. Dempsey, West Point 74. McChrystal, West Point 76. Kensinger, West Point 70. Uh, Brigadier General Vagina Pharisee. Uh, oh, excuse me, I slipped. She's now at the VA. Sometimes I forget that. Yeah, Gina Pharisee works at the VA. Um, and now we're going to go back and daily double because those names I rattled off are, in fact, the flag officers that have suppressed the truth of the Pat Tillman murder. Um, how about the truth of why these five people signed off on the destruction of Extortion 17, checking my memory, which should have been the 6th of August of 2011. Uh, this is a shorter list. The previous list had like seven or eight people. This one has five, but one of them was on the previous list. The five people that were aware of the Extortion 17 hit uh, before it happened were Obama, Leon Panetta, Martin Dempsey, G87 Diagonal OP, OPIE, and Colonel Thomas Rickard. David, do you think that I have pretty good recall? Excellent. Pastry I got. I didn't say pasties. Um, I said pastry. David, over to you. Okay, I'm going to read from Wikipedia because I think this is absolutely critical. And this guy, Jervis, I think is potentially a role model for you as you move towards a formal request to Congress to issue letters of mark and reprisal to confiscate the network time protocol devices in the custody of Circo and its shareholders. Jervis was also recognized by both political and military contemporaries as a fine administrator and naval reformer. As commander-in-chief, and we've heard of that the title before, as commander-in-chief of the Mediterranean between 1795 and 1799, he introduced a series of severe standing orders to avert mutiny. He applied those orders to both seamen and officers alike, a policy that made him a controversial figure. He took his disciplinarian system of command with him when he took command of the Channel Fleet in 1799. He, in 1801, as First Lord of the Admiralty, he introduced a number of reforms that, though unpopular at the time, made the Navy more efficient and more self-sufficient. He introduced innovations, including block-making machinery at Portsmouth Royal Dockyard, St. Vincent was known for his generosity to officers he considered worthy of reward and his swift and often harsh punishment of those he felt deserved it. Deserved it. And this is his entry into the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography by P.K. Crimin, who describes Jervis's contribution to history as follows. 
His importance lies in his being the organizer of victories, the creator of well-equipped, highly efficient fleets, and in training a school of officers as professional, energetic, and devoted to the service as himself. So you put him on one side of the scales field, and you put Barry Sutero, the commander-in-chief, on the other, and what's going to happen, do you think, to the scales? Over to you. I think the sissy is going to develop gas veins. Oh, the scale? Yeah, yeah the scale would go down heavy on one side, and uh, the sissy would be launched into uh, Earth orbit on the other side because he laps, lacks any substance. And if he doesn't like me saying that he lacks substance, well, go ahead and grow some uh, big ones there, Barry Swatero, Punahou 79. Don't irritate me, David, by making me talk about him. But I do enjoy it every time you say something about semen. Over to you, David. Okay, so just uh, moving on from Jervis, but I'll just give you a flavor of how, how shall I put it, advanced this guy was in his thinking. At the age of 13, he ran away and joined the Navy at Woolwich in London. Now, that's a 13-year-old. Well, that's, uh, he's a teenager, right? So 12, 13. That's a very young age to feel drawn to the sea in that manner. Now, what was Barry doing at 13? If I understand correctly, Phil, he was a Chum gang leader at Punahou School, having been groomed in the art of pedophile entrapment by a cross-dressing male prostitute by the name of Turley in Jakarta in eight years old. At what point do you think the Americans are going to wake up to understand they've been had? Over to you. Uh, frankly, I just had this conversation with the former Marine. Of course, none of us Marines ever quit being Marines. You can call it an illness or a lifetime avocation, and either way, we don't quit. Uh, we can be killed. We can't be caused to quit. Now, that sissy you're talking about, Turdy, or Turdy 2, um, when he was 8 and 13, he was bending over and grabbing his ankles and getting paid for it. Uh, and even though I don't think that the United States of America uh, citizenry is ever going to figure out the truth in large numbers, we don't have to have more than 3% to gain victory. Um, and I think that we will arrive at that point. Uh, and I think my letter of mark and reprisal, actually it's your idea, but it would be my letter. I think that may be effective. There may be, and uh, I say maybe, there may be some loyal member of Congress. I sort of doubt it. But if somebody knows of a congressman, which can also be a female, congressman is the proper term, if anybody knows of a loyal congressman, uh, and I sure don't, uh, what's her name, Bachman, Michelle Bachman was the last one I felt was confident. She left and went to Switzerland. Uh, but this is a group project because we're all in this together. And I don't mean, let me just see what countries are represented. There's Afterburner, England, Alicia, who is an American, but she also represents Mexico. Uh, do 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 um, you and you you represent Canada and by extension United Kingdom and I've lost control over the oh I just got it back um, David Beach is over there in the UK and I can't remember if I'm pronouncing this uh, do, 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 McNichol good old Doug who's got a heart of gold he's over in England let's see who else we have I wait a minute either I missed one they're right behind David Beach is Denise C. from the UK. Uh, doo, doo, doo. If I miss anybody from the UK or outside the country, I apologize. I'm having a little trouble with my computer. Uh, Keter, magic. Uh, I always, well, anyway, I'm not sure what country Keter's from, but please let us know. Lady Zaga is from Toronto, Canada. Uh, there's a new name there. Michael Butler, welcome aboard. Um, Ryan Wilson's another new name. Welcome. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Well, I think I've identified all the people, but see, it's not just the United States of America that need to get rid of Barry Swatero, Punahou 79. Uh, it's, if there is a free world, 
still, and I'm not certain there is. I'm certain there could be. Um, but if there's still a free world, it's all the people in the free world need to uh, re-legitimize the United States of America and make it be the beacon on a hill that it was intended to be. But uh, for a couple hundred years, we've been getting a lot of resistance from the powers uh, at the Crown Agency and the Royals. Uh, that's my opinion, not David's. Um, and the bankers and the Vatican. So, and you know, I could take care of that. Let's see, if I if they made me a five-star general, and the logic is I'm senior to all the four-star generals by virtue of when I was commissioned. Uh, let's just do the math. Dunford was commissioned in 77. I was commissioned in 71. Dempsey was commissioned in 74. I was commissioned in 71. So I'm already senior to them. I'm already more loyal than they are. I'm already free of treason charges. Um, if anyone in the government wanted to authorize me to become a five-star general, I'd immediately be senior to these little piss ants, and I'd call them in one by one. I know there's 30 of them out there that are traitors. Uh, I know who I think the biggest traitor of the bunch is. I'll remain quiet on that, but if anybody sees me in England in Operation Rose Petal or Operation Hot Kitchen, and when Craig comes in, if anybody sees Craig come in, tell him I'm going to need not no pressure. He loves doing this, but I'm going to need to get about 500 of these cards published again uh, for Operation Hot Kitchen or Rose Petal, and I think that Hot Kitchen may be sort of a smaller operation. But we have until the 21st of August to, well, let me just demonstrate. This is how, this is how we dictate to them. Previously, I'd announced that uh, Operation Jade Helm had been forestalled to the 2nd of August. And a couple of people in the chat room said, hey, Field, where'd you get the date, the 7th of August? Excuse me, the 2nd, the 2nd of August. Uh, and I didn't answer the question. Uh, the date now has been slipped 14 days. Anybody want to know if you slip, that's a fortnight to England, if you slip from the 2nd of August and you slip, did I say 14 days, which is a fortnight? No, I meant 21 days, which is three weeks. Three weeks after the 2nd of August is the 23rd of August, off the top of my very tired head. Um, and I think Jade Helm can't, go to full strength, not to be confused with the purple tip dread champion and full battle strength. Um, these little piss ants, as they get exposed, they start, rather than realize who it is that's exposed them, I'm taking a pregnant pause on purpose. Rather than realizing who it is that has exposed them, they think that they're being ratted out by their peers. For instance, Dempsey probably thinks that somebody else in the Dirty 30 Club has fingered him. Good, David, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Phil. So today's post, the title is 2398, Circa 8A Hacks Marine Corps General's Clock, Clinton Sheraton Snuff Film Bet, How Ambassador Barshevsky spot fixed Captain Chick. And just so I think it's useful to say what the goals are, I believe collectively at Able Danger, we're inferring the goal is that you acquire, well, no, you don't need to acquire military status while you're a civilian because you are a Marine. And letters of mark and reprisal can be issued by Congress, authorized by the President of the United States, to private citizens, together with others, to go and punish uh, offending parties in principalities or dominions or kingdoms that have visited a great wrong on the citizens of the party receiving the authorization. And of course we're talking about 911, where a great wrong was inflicted on the citizens of the United States and military or former military personnel by killing them. So here's paragraph one. Serco allegedly used 8A set-aside contracts 
to hack the clocks of former U.S. Marine Corps General James Logan Jones, Jr., and set up man-in-the-middle attacks on Marines guarding American embassies abroad and the Pentagon renovation project through 911. Do you uh, want to make any comment on James Logan Jones, Field? Over to you. Yes, let me quote his niece. I was going down to Texas, and let me just see who from Texas might be here today. Uh, I am having a little difficulty with my computer, but nothing major. Uh, do, 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 do. Nope, there's nobody from Texas. Well, I can't say that. I don't think there's anybody from Texas that will recall uh, Swamp. She may have heard this comment, Swamper Mama. She, would, I've never met her, if you're wondering. Um, and she's never met me either. Swamp her mama would remember this. I don't think Sherlock's here or Jack. Not if they were, they'd remember it. If Craig Peterson were here, he'd remember it. David, I don't think you'd remember it, but are you ready for your answer? Okay, I, I, I do know you have your mic off. Um, I was seated in seat one alpha in the front of an Airbus, and I was go not the cockpit, but first class. I was going from Minneapolis to Dallas, Fort Worth Airport, not to be confused with Dallas Love Field. You heard me, Love Field. Okay, is this, is that James Jones, by the way, Swamper Mama? I'm going to hold off right there. Um, I, if anybody knows if that's James Jones, I got to minimize something. I'm going to stop. Okay, yeah, that's James Jones. Okay. He is six foot four. Whoop de blanking do. Um, he's a Georgetown Jesuit. Do you remember the operation over in, uh, well, what year was it? Was it Thanksgiving of 2010 or no? It was Thanksgiving of 2008 when there was a, uh, an amphibious attack on Mumbai. Do you remember that, David, yes or no? Yes. I think if Swamper Mama or Jack Mac or Jake R or Afterburner or anyone else sniffed around, I think they would find that this Jesuit wannabe Marine uh, was involved. A, no, O-B-E-R-O-I. Somebody want to check my brain, see if it was the Hotel Oberai? O-B-E-R-O-I. Anyway, guess what this, um, I got into this first class seat, 1A, and I thought this is great because we're done boarding and the seat next to me is empty. Uh, but I was wrong because as they were closing the front boarding door, a woman, 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 have you got cheating on your mind? Anyway, uh, she didn't have that on her mind, this woman, came up from the rear of the aircraft and sat next to me. She was seated in one B. And uh, I said, well, that's interesting. I've been hanging around the airlines for 40 years, give or take, and I've never seen anybody come forward from the back of the aircraft into first class. How did you arrange that? And she said, well, there was a family, um, a woman, and this is back when we didn't have homosexual marriages, by the way, it's a couple years ago. She said, there's a family traveling together, a man and his wife, and uh, one of them was seated in seat 1B, where I've now am seated. Uh, not really, David. Anyway, she said, the woman and the man wanted to sit together, and since there were two seats in first class, the man said, would you mind if I take your coach seat and you can have my first class seat? And the woman said, what am I, nuts? Of course, I'll take your first class seat. So that woman came up, sat next to me. So we take off, we're flying over Omaha or somewhere, and uh, she says, are you from Texas? I said, I was born there, but I live in Wisconsin. I said, how about you? She says, uh, no, I'm just traveling there on business. And I said, oh, what business are you in? And she told me, let me take a pregnant pause. And she said, what business are you in? And I said, well, it's only a short flight to Dallas, and if I started to scratch the surface of what I do, we'd have to... Uh, go into a holding pattern until we're out of fuel. But I said, expose treason and I expose evil acts. And she says, oh, then you, <laughs> I'm not making this up, David. The woman says, you expose treason? And I said, yes, I do. She said, well, you should consider taking a good look at my 
uncle. I said, who's your uncle? She said, he's a four-star general in the Marine Corps. And without skipping a beat, I said, you're not talking. She said, how did you get that so quick? I said, I looked at my $10 Walmart. I said, well, you know, it's 2013. And I had that guy in 2008 when he participated in the false flag attack on the Oberai Hotel. David, I'll turn it over to you because I want to know, am I correct? Is it the Oberai Hotel? Uh, Church Mouse is in Canada, but in, been to Texas many times. Yeah, this guy, James Jones, according to his own, oh, let me give you some more piling on. According to his own niece, he's such a jerk that when he was uh, attending the marriage, the wedding of one of his daughters or nieces, he flew into the reception in a Marine Corps helicopter in his uniform. That's a typical Georgetown graduate. Uh, Naval Academy knuckle dragger wouldn't think of doing that. David, over to you. Yeah, and that's very interesting because I think uh, James Jones brought in the Circo 808 clock into the Marines for these man in the middle attacks, where the timing signals sent to the Marines, witting or unwitting, got them to do things that they would not ordinarily do, like stand down the guard on the Pentagon or the Pentagon renovation project during the 911 attack. Let's go to the second paragraph. Serco is allegedly providing 8A and Clinton guests in Sheraton, in brackets, Starwood. The Starwood group bought the Sheraton chain from ITT in 1998. ITT, of course, is the company that provides uh, ad hoc uh, waypoint signals into planes prior to their being hijacked and either landed safely or crashed at a very specific time. And Clinton guests in Sheraton Starwood hotel rooms with the timing signals to support snuff film, in brackets, assassination betting, where bettors with the closest prediction to the date and time stamp of the money shot scoop the pot. Uh, if there's anyone in the chat room who doesn't know what a money shot is, then perhaps they could check back on the uh, stuff that has been going into the books written by Field and other studies over the past years. So this is a dilemma because people presumably can quite legitimately travel or visit or hold conventions in the Sheraton Hotel without understanding that the Wi-Fi communications of the Sheraton Starwood hotel chain are operated by Circa for the purposes of surveillance and entrapment. So let's say Joseph Dunford, for example, the Marine Corps general who's standing by to be promoted chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, decides, and I'm going to ask you that, um, to hold a or become the guest of honor at a Marine summit in the Pentagon City Hotel, which overlooks the crime scene of 911 at the Pentagon. And so my question to you, Field, is what gives the idea of to a Marine Corps general that it's a safe and secure place to have a summit with his fellow Marines in a hotel that had cameras on the roof which were apparently disabled or the content was taken away that would have caught images of whatever it was across the Pentagon lawn at 530 miles an hour and took out Captain Gerald DeConto, the duty officer of the US Navy Command Center in the Pentagon. So let me just repeat that. Would that be a secure place for the Marines to have a summit? And would it indicate that General Jones, or General Joseph Dunford for that matter, are either incompetent or treasonous? Over to you. Well, they could be monitored there. That's why they were stuck in the Sheraton. On the morning of 9-11, uh, it was choice two. The, the cameras on top of the Sheraton uh, would have been disabled by Circos and the United States Senior Executive Service uh, agents, or if anything of a film nature uh, was captured, it would be immediately taken by the FBI. Uh, and the FBI would, you know, well, in the case of the film from the gas station directly across the street from where 
the uh, Raytheon A3 Sky Warrior, and I think the registration number was one of these three numbers. It's it's it starts with N and ends with Romeo Sierra, uh, but eight seven four eight seven six or eight seven eight. So uh, if anybody wants to go to faa.gov and go to the registration search, it'll pop up on the front page. You'll see it says search registration number or search November number, and as in November. Uh, if anyone searches November, which is N, 874-Romeo Sierra RS, like Robert Simpson. See, we have an agent for everything. But uh, uh, those three A3 Sky Warriors were owned on the morning of 9-11 by Raytheon Corporation, which has its signature all over 9-11, including they killed, was it five? Yes, it was five senior executives. Uh, they killed five of their senior executives on three of the 9-11 flights. Uh, so how did they happen to get these three knowing Raytheon executives onto the flights? Uh, the same way they got the, uh, I keep getting the guy's name mixed up, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but the, com the, commander, the commander of the small boat unit, Goulding, I think, yeah, I had his initials. I was calling him G.H., Gerald Holding, when his name is really H.G., which is probably Harold Golding. Anyway, they uh, shut him up because he knew too much. And what did he know? Well, among other things, it is believed widely that he knew uh, something about Ainsworth Davis and uh, the, I forgot the name of the city, but there was a corrupted raid where 3,637 uh, Allied troops were either killed, wounded, or captured. And somebody will know the name of that failed raid. I believe the date of the raid might have been in 1942, but they were going into a, um, they were actually, they were raiding the German mainland through a water feature. And uh, that Ainsworth Davis, I believe, is the guy who snitched and let the Germans know. And the reason they let the Germans know that the Brits were coming is they had a double agent whose name has three letters and it might be J-A-D. Uh, they wanted to test the loyalty of a double agent. And so what they did, they threw the allies to the wolves. 3,600 plus were killed, captured, or injured because the rat bastards in service of the crown wanted to test one of their double agents. Well, guess what? Uh, some of us pass our test. In fact, uh, if Swamper Mama has the time, would you please put up Proverbs 16.9? Uh, and let's see who else might be here. Oh, George Holdsworth. Whether you believe in it or not, because I don't care if anybody believes this or not, it doesn't matter to me. But would you please put up 2 Timothy 4.7? Uh, one of them says, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, the first one, Proverbs 16.90 says, A man may make plans with his heart, but God directs his steps. Um, the second one is a tribute from me personally to Aaron Carson Vaughn and the others that were killed aboard Extortion 17. He's, uh, the quote is, I have fought the fight. I have run the race, I have kept the faith, or something like that. Uh, I don't want to turn this into a church party, but uh, the truth is that victory is possible, and the penalty for treason, which is 18 U.S. Code, Section 2381, 2382, 2383, uh, treason uh, has a pretty high price tag. David, over to you. Yeah, and in, I think in the art of war, the great phrase is know your enemy, and we're getting very close to knowing the enemy. Now, Phil, there's a picture up in the chat room, I'll put it in again if it's too far up, uh, scroll, of uh, guys dressed in various ways, but in particular wearing a nice fashionable sort of coat, 
marked FBI, carrying evidence away from the Pentagon lawn, which of course is a felony. There's a woman there, black. You know how often I like to riff on black one-legged lesbians. Now, I don't know whether she's a lesbian. She's certainly black and she's got two legs but she would fall into the category of a typical employee or agent for one of your sister's 8A companies. Remember, your sister was the chief operating officer of the Small Business Administration on 911 with a $60 billion guaranteed loan portfolio and countless thousands of 8A companies. And um, this, she looks like a very suitable candidate for this uh, riff on the disadvantaged minorities that are being screwed by white Anglo-Saxon Protestant heterosexuals. I don't see too many of those there, at least in the conventional sense. Now, there's a guy in the background, well, behind the woman and a guy carrying a piece of fuselage, and he's got a camera, and he's evidently taking photographs of what he sees on the lawn. So I'd like to know where those images are. And I'll bet you there are images that indicate items on the Pentagon lawn consistent with the network time protocol devices used to on the guidance and control system of the weapons platform that took out the Pentagon's U.S. Navy Command Center. Now, further behind... There is a guy in a uniform. I can't tell whether he's actually got a gun, but can you tell me, is that a Marine's utility uniform? Over to you. I got to scroll up. But hang on, because I, I noticed something. No, uh, it's not, I don't think. It's certainly not a uniform. But the interesting thing, and I'd like anyone who can blow that picture up, I'd like to know if the thing that's triangular in the left hand of the guy that's dressed up like an FBI agent, I'd like to know if that triangular thing, uh, it's covered up, so you can really can't see, except for it looks to me like the rear tip of it might be orange. Uh, however, uh, if it's triangular, I know what that is. Do you have any idea what piece of an A3 Sky Warrior is triangular and recognizable because it's not... In fact, they were really sort of stupid to do that uh, because they got a straight probe, a refueling probe, that's unique to the A3. They got a triangular window, which is unique to the A3. And the biggest, if I wasn't a gentleman, I'd say something. The biggest error was they used an aircraft that has a rectangular fuselage. Uh, the only jet transport that I'm aware of that was in existence on September 11th of 2001 that has a rectangular fuselage is the Douglas A3 Sky Warrior. See also John McCain. See also treason. David, over to you. Yeah, okay, Phil. But this guy, he is in camo sort of uniform. So if it's not Marines, what is it? It's not a uniform because that he's wearing a gray T-shirt. No, 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 no. The guy almost up to the door, he's got a peaked hat. Oh. It's in camp. I yeah. see. I was looking at the wrong guy. That could either be, uh, well, actually, it could be anybody in special forces, but it's the odds are very good it's either a Marine or an Army. Uh, I see him now. He's facing to his, or, no, he's facing to our right. I didn't see him. I thought you were talking about the guy with the green slacks and the uh, gray t shirt. Okay, well, I believe that guy is coordinating as the one armed, and I think that's a gun that he's got, he's coordinating the spoliation of evidence on the Pentagon lawn. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, it's a fair assessment. Now, what I need to know is if Afterburner has figured out that it's time for her to see her pastry. Let's see. Linda, we have custard slices here. Ah, let's see, Afterburner. Okay, well, I'm going to show her her reward. Oh, she's put up the pastry. Uh, anyway, David, while I show her her reward uh, to end the speculation, uh, I'll turn it over to you for some more smart stuff. Okay, so the hypothesis would be there is a war room inside the Pentagon City Sheraton Hotel 
where the people engaged in snuff film or assassination betting are placing their money against uh, the named uh, targets together with the pot that they wish to build of dollars to fund the killing of those targets and the time that the individual better is predicting that they're going to die and a very high value target. Well, there were two particularly high value targets in this particular crime scene. One is Captain Chick Burlingham, the pilot of American Flight 77, and the other would be Captain Gerald DeConto, who was the duty officer of the Pentagon's US Navy Command Center, that would have, very interestingly, a variety of clocks scattered around the building and uh, let me just uh, go to my post this morning and get a picture of some rather anomalous timing of the clocks in the Pentagon. Now, I don't think these clocks field were mechanical clocks, that my dad was a clock collector, so on Sunday morning in the Kentish countryside, my job was to wind up all the clocks and synchronize them. Did you say Cavendish? Uh, you, Cavendish, no. Well, what was the countryside? A Kentish countryside. Okay, because Cavendish is my preferred mixed fruit drops. It's Cavendish and Harvey. So I thought we had a daily double, but we don't. David, back to being smart. Okay, now why I don't get a picture with photo bucket, but what I wanted to present, maybe someone smarter than me can take that link and get the images off it, but it shows pictures of two mechanical clocks, or at least uh, maybe they were battery-driven clocks at the Pentagon, and one I think shows the time 9.32, and the other one shows the time 9.37. So the particular article where I found that uh, image or collage asked the question, well, do we are we really expected to believe that the military personnel in the Pentagon have clocks that are separated by such a gap when they require millisecond precision to execute their special operations. So I think what is being done there is they're scattering images around that will confuse the public. But the most accurate assessment of the time of impact and presumed death or perceived death of Captain Gerald de Conto and uh, Captain Chick Burlingham would be September 12th, 2001, 9.37.19 on the morning of September 12, 11th, 2001. Now let me put this combined image into the chat room. It's already so there, David. It. It's already there. Ah, excellent. And here's the next image. Right, so we've got in the chat room the electrical driven clocks indicating what it looks like 936, one of them, and below that 937. So what's the explanation for the discrepancy? Further down, we have one of Craig's brilliant collages with the octopus, and it says, September the 12th, 2001, 1737, 19. And I think it's the difference between those times and this digital readout, the date stamp and the time stamp, that is going to put a significant number of these people on death row. So we have to ask ourselves, if, this, if the hypothesis is that the Sheraton Hotel chain has been equipped with rooms where bettors can bet on the time of the money shot of the snuff film around the world, and they end up with a digital readout, September 12, 2001, 17, 37, 19, which is at the bottom of the four frames that show something crossing the Pentagon lawn. And each of those four frames shows the same date and the same time. So things are happening pretty quickly. But that's the kind of precision you'd associate with a snuff film betting room. 
because the betters may be putting what fifty thousand or five million or fifty million into the pot to secure the outcome where the Pentagon uses loses its US Navy command center, which is really quite a staggering uh, crack in America's ability to defend itself when you think about it. So it could be worth a great deal of money to a lot of people, including the people who donated money to the Clinton Foundation, like the Qatari government and the Dubai government and the Saudi government. So let's see if we can reverse engineer, a la Sherlock Holmes, this event or result, September the 12th, 2001, 1737. So nominally the time in Washington at the Pentagon in the Pentagon City Hotel, the Sheraton Hotel, is 9.37.19. And that's what the guys in the snuff film room see. And they presume or infer from that that whoever was on the receiving end of that explosion is dead, i.e. they died at or on September the 12th, 2001, 17.37.19. But it's not in dispute that it was September the 11th when they died, at least in Washington. And it's not in dispute, although there's some variation about the times shown on the clocks, that they died at or near 9.37, 19 seconds. So where do we need to go to in the world to find a Sheraton Hotel where it's actually September the 12th, 2001? I'd say Port Douglas, Australia. And who was staying in Port Douglas William, Hotel in Queensland? William Jefferson Rockefeller. Right. So the former president of the United States, whose former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, John Shalik Aspley, he sent to Beijing in 1997 to address the senior officers of the People's Liberation Army and authorize him to hand over details of all America's weapons programs. They would appear to have the potential to be linked up during the real-time live broadcast snuff films of 911. So where was John Shalikashvili? And that's shown in that collage um, with his little hat and his glasses. And his pinhead. And where was he? Well, he was a director of Boeing. And he was the son of Dmitry Shalikashvili who was a major in the Waffen-SS, who lied about his past under Operation Paperclip to enter the country, still being loyal to the values of the Waffen-SS, whatever they were. I think his six-year-old or seven-year-old son, the family moved to Illinois. And sometime later, John Shalik Cashville embarked on a career presumably as a professional traitor to the United States, but he moved rapidly up the hierarchy until under the Clintons he became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. When he left that position, he went to work for Boeing, and something very odd happened to Boeing after John Shalik Ashley became a director. One, Boeing was forced to hand off the operations of its command, control, communications, computers, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance to CERCO, which is a funny thing to do for the world's largest civilian and military aircraft manufacturer. And the headquarters office was moved from Washington State to Chicago. And in Chicago, at the time of that move, I think it was May of 2001, they started moving in, and the headquarters office was commissioned on the morning of 911. The same day as the Pentagon's US Navy Command Center upgrade was commissioned, at possibly the same time. And regrettably for the United States of America, the upgrade to the U.S. Navy Command Center and the Pentagon had a prime contractor by the name of AMIC, which
which is a British company. So almost game, set, and match for the Republic. So going back to the snuff film room at the Pentagon City for the betting on the precise time when Captain Gerald DeConto and Captain Chick Burlingham were predicted to die, we have a very odd gap between the time shown on the timestamp of the images outside the Pentagon and the time at the Pentagon itself. We have 9.37.19 at the Pentagon and we have 17.37.19 on the timestamp. So let's spin around the world and see if we can find a possible location relevant to the 911 attack, which is eight hours later than when the attack actually occurred or is said to have occurred or is perceived to have occurred at the Pentagon. And lo and behold, we come to the United Arab Emirates, specifically Dubai, where there is a Sheraton Hotel called the Dubai Creek Hotel, where I've stayed, and I don't know if you stayed there, Field, when you visited Dubai. I stayed at but the I Chelsea did. Tower. Oh, right. Well, that's just kitty corner, I think, from the Dubai Creek Hotel. But the Dubai Creek Hotel is interesting because that's where Osama bin Laden stayed when he was on a dialysis machine at the Dubai Hospital. Now, when did he leave? Well, I'm quite sure the people at the Dubai Creek Hotel know when he left. And I presume they would have known where, if there was, a snuff film betting room specially equipped for what I believe Dr. Thomas Barnett described as the first live broadcast mass snuff film in human history. So I think we can assume that Osama bin Laden's family members and the British uh, Circo 818 that was staging the attack had a snuff film bedding room inside the Dubai Creek Hotel that would have shown 1737-19 as the time of the impact on the Pentagon's U.S. Navy Command Center. So lo and behold, we've got three, four, five, or six Sheraton hotels that had they been interconnected through Wi-Fi and the Onion Router by Circo, and we know that Circo did provide that service, you had a matrix of snuff film betters that would have been engaged in what is known as digital fires. That is placing their money against the name of a preferred target that would be collected by the party best able to predict the time of death of the said party. So we've got the Sheraton's Port Douglas Hotel in Australia at about 003719, that's not particularly about, it's fairly precise, but actually they can go better than that, they can go into milliseconds and possibly microseconds, but I digress. Where little Billy is tucked up in bed with probably an underage hooker, getting his rocks off watching the murder of Captain Gerald de Conto and Captain Chick Birmingham. Now, whether he knew these two, I don't know. He might have done because both of them being Marines. Well, oh, hang on. Be... Both of the yeah. guys you mentioned were naval officers, not Marines. Oh, all right. Well, close enough to the Marine detachment guarding the president that he might have known them. But Maybe that's not too critical. No, it's critical. I just want to make sure that we're accurate. Right. So we've got the Port Douglas Sheraton, where it's September the 12th, 2001, at 003719 at the time of impact at the Pentagon. We've got the Dubai Creek Hotel, where I used to stay, where Osama bin Laden stayed to get his dialysis treatment. And they would have seen the time of impact or the money shot when 
Captain Gerald de Conto and Chick Burlingham were perceived to have died. They didn't necessarily die at that time, but the perception is everything that counts. So since they were significant donors in that area to the Clinton Foundation, I imagine they were betting, engaged in what is known as online or remote assassination betting. So they would have needed a very precise time so that the party closest to it could scoop the pot. Now, who would they scoop the pot and share this pot with? Well, the 8A company that was able to execute the hit with such precision. Now, what happens if they got it wrong? They could get some very powerful people very angry because if they bet that the time of death of De Conto and uh, Burlingham was closer than what actually occurred, they should have got scooped the pot. And maybe we're talking not just hundreds of thousands of dollars, but millions. I believe the Clintons have actually earned, if that's the right word, about $137 million dollars since leaving office. So that money has to have come from somewhere. Then we have the Pentagon City Sheraton Hotel overlooking the flight path of the weapons platform that took out part of the facade of Wedge One under construction by AMEC, the British company, at 9.37. 19. Excuse me. Go ahead. The construction had been completed and the keys were turned over that morning, correct? Okay, the commissioning yeah. of the upgrade of the Pentagon renovation project, which had been handed off to a variety of people by AMEC, the prime contractor, including the network time protocols of the upgrade being handed off to Serco and its master clock at Greenwich, sorry, at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington, where in turn, Serco had mentored an SBA 8A company by the name of Base One Technologies at New Rochelle, Westchester County, New York State, 20 minutes up the road from Bill and Hillary Clinton's house, which they bought in 1998. And Base One Technologies collaborated with other 8A companies, you know, the companies owned by one-legged black lesbians who might feel that they're disadvantaged by a bunch of uh, supercilious heterosexual Caucasians. So these parties would have been in a business to share the pot if they were able to nail these targets at precisely 737.19 in Washington, 17, no, correction, 937.19 in Washington, 1737.19 at the Dubai Creek Hotel, and 00.37.19 on September the 12th at the Port Douglas Sheraton Hotel. So what other hotels, Sheraton Hotels, might we go to to understand the particular timing well, how about the Sheraton in Chicago? The Sheraton in Chicago was where Bill Clinton set up his headquarters for the 1996 campaign. And presumably, and of course this is just a guess, it's potentially a place where John Shalikashvili stayed through 911 because he wouldn't have wanted to be in the Boeing headquarters office in case it got blown up. Remember, one of the objectives here is for Serco's A day companies to decapitate America. So we've got some interesting Sheraton hotels, all of which linked through a virtual floating matrix of the onion router by Serco, would have had the ability to impute very precise ad hoc waypoints in the journey allegedly taken by Captain Chick Burlingham towards the Pentagon and the weapons platform that, if I understand feel correctly, was flying in the radar shadow of Captain Burlingham's plane, and take Captain Burlingham's plane over the Pentagon, 
using the clock in the Boeing E-4B above the Pentagon to be dropped into a zone in the Atlantic. Can you just do a little explanation of where you think that was dropped and what was the ship near it? Over to you. Uh, I don't recall a ship being near it, but it was dropped in Whiskey 386 Alpha airspace. But the ship that was 60 miles away, and that's probably what you're alluding to, was an aircraft carrier which was in Norfolk getting uh, some, uh, getting refurbished or d getting some routine upgrades. And so the crew, they had a skeleton crew aboard the ship, and I'm fumbling because I can't remember, I think it was USS George, no, 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 USS George Washington was up by New York City because that's where the uh, two Raytheon owned e, uh, A3 Sky Warriors were launched, I believe. Uh, David, do you happen to remember the name of the carrier that was in Norfolk and they were running a ghost command post because the they only had caretakers aboard. They did not have the normal crew and complement. The significance being in the uh, CIC, which is a, uh, it's a secure place on a combatant U.S. Navy vessel, and CIC stands for Combat Information Center, uh, they had all the hardware and communication gear that they would need to run the attack of 9-11 uh, and coordinate with the two AWACS from NATO that were standing off Washington, D.C. and uh, New York. And for those of you who haven't ever heard that before, NATO operates A330 AWACS aircraft uh, out of Brussels or some other place in Belgium. Anybody want to put up a uh, an image of a NATO Airbus 330 AWACS? Or uh, does anybody want to put up a link that would link uh, any text or narrative talking about the two NATO A3s standing off Washington and New York on the morning of 9-11. Uh, did you remember that aircraft carrier's name that was in Norfolk? Is it Eisenhower? I think so, but watch, watch how good our chat room is. Uh, if someone were to go to uh, this, whenever you need to search anything we've ever written, put in the search term, uh, in this case, we're not searching for Eisenhower, we're searching for aircraft carrier. So put in aircraft carrier plus chips plus pastel plus IOC plus Norfolk, N-O-R-F-O-L-K plus 9-11. Over to you, David. Yeah, thanks, Phil. So I've got the USNO master clock image in the chat room a fairly impressive uh, looking piece of uh, technology. And above that, I got an image of the principal alleged conspirators, or at least some of them, on 911 in Marine One, which I think is the proper name for the Marine helicopter that uh, flies the President of the United States into the helicopter pad by the Pentagon. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, Marine One is the helicopter. It's operated by HMX One, which is at the uh, Marine Corps Air Station Quantico, and if it's significant to Navy or Marine Intelligence, you might want to see what Mel DeMars, M-E-L, and then second name is D-E-M-A-R-S. Uh, what's Mel DeMars' relationship to HMX-1, and how did he earn a silver star in that phony baloney war down in the Caribbean that's so insignificant, I've forgotten the name of the island, but basically, we had a little practice amphibious and air assault on some insignificant island because there were some college kids that were in peril. Well, guess what? If you listen to the lyrics of Eternal Father Strong to Save, whose hand can calm the restless wave, uh, that's called the Navy Hymn. Uh, and it is a hymn written to invoke safety for those in peril on the sea. And yesterday, with my own eyes, I heard Senator Ted Cruz reading a script and uh, a barking seal, uh, Joseph Denford, responding to the script. Uh, and it looks to me like 
when they talk about our nation being in peril, and it was Ted Cruz that said that, uh, well, not necessarily. We got a few good gunslingers around. Uh, David, what do you think the lapse time was between the dog and pony show between Ted Cruz and Joseph Dunford and my letter of market reprisal? Would you have a guess? Uh, I don't, but while you answer first, I'll be a gentleman and I'll answer second after I come up with a guess. Over to you. A few hours. Yeah, that's what I'd guess too. And you know, the one person that could probably figure that out the quickest is Swamper Mama. I don't know if Jake's here today. Yeah, he is. He could probably figure it out too. Uh, if anybody knows the time that that YouTube went up yesterday where Senator Ted Cruz was appearing to be asking difficult questions of uh, General Dunford, uh, within hours, and I'm, I'm guessing it was no more than four hours between their dog and pony show and my uh, request for letters of Mark and Marine reprisal. David, over to you. Yeah, I'm just gazing at this Marine One um, picture and looking at the principal offenders. Um, so you, on the left, you've got um, little Barry with his jug ears. His back is uh, turned to us. And we have to remember that this guy would appear to have been groomed by a cross-dressing male prostitute when he was seven or eight years old. And that would be 1968 period. And after a little more grooming at Punahou School, in 1981, he finds himself in the Lahore Hilton with his mother. And my guess is that uh, he's servicing significant players in the Pakistan intelligence services, going into their rooms and doing whatever is required of him. And the hotel is gathering the evidence necessary to be backhauled to the United Kingdom, where either then or shortly afterwards, the hotel, the Hilton Hotel chain International outside the United States would be acquired by Ladbrokes, the world's leading retail bookmaker. And uh, Ladbrokes, of course, um, has an amazing service that it can basically allow you to bet on anything, it would appear, including remote assassination betting, yet to be proven, except that Ladbrokes set up an operation with an outfit called Psycom in Kuala Lumpur as a call center prior to the disappearance of the two Malaysian Airlines planes. So they were certainly in a position, they had motive, opportunity and weapon to engage in remote assassination betting on selected targets on those two aircraft. So then we have General Jones, and I think then he was a national security advisor to the President of the United States, um, Barry Sotero. And that's an interesting title because Maureen Baginski, when she left the service at the FBI and the NSA, she got a gig as Vice President of Serco and National Security Advisor to Serco. So isn't it interesting you've got Baginski advising Serco on national security and you've got General Jones advising Little Barry. Over on the right, one of those is Mullen, I think, Admiral Mullen, another one is Dempsey, and then you have uh, Cattlegate Clinton. And it would appear that Cattlegate Clinton was recruited in the Chicago Sheraton Hotel around the 1965 period to set up various honey pots and honey traps for Nixon and his friends. So I'll just, I'm kind of asking a rhetorical question. What uh, time do you think the people inside Marine One are operating on? And I'll answer that. I think they're operating on Circo time. Accurate to within one second in 130 million years. 
Now let me get a picture of a clock that I think unwittingly many Marines are operating on, and this is kind of symbolic and slightly tongue-in-cheek, and it's not my tongue in someone else's cheek, but I guess that's a bit of a distraction. And let me put in that clock. There we have a nice little wooden clock, and my heart goes out for the Marines who probably, when they look at this clock, they feel a sense of pride. It's a nice little ornament. I don't know whether it's handmade or it's mass-produced, etc. But I think the average, and I don't know whether you can call a Marine a grunt, is that is that an Army term for him? It's both. A grunt simply means an infantry person. Okay, so when a Marine grunt goes into action, they may well be going in with the wristwatch or maybe one of these Rockwell Collins a little GPS uh, clock that is more accurate. But they must believe as they go into action, maybe they're deployed to guard an embassy in East Africa or uh, a mission in Benghazi or a CIA annex. They probably never even dream of the possibility that the clock or time which is being used by the officers to deploy them has a different time to the clock that they're looking at with their travel gear or utility kit or whatever. And the horrors for the Marines is if you want to launch a man in the middle attack, all you need is to have an error or a gap between the time used by the people intending to kill them or the people they're supposed to be guarding and the time that they're actually operating on with their fellow members in a special operations executive team. So what is devastating for the Marines and their viability, and that comes back to uh, Admiral Jervis, is they're out of sync with their chain of command, which has been compromised. And the chain of command during 911 of the Marines was uh, directed by Marine General James Jones, which who, who, as Field has pointed out, is considered a traitor by a number of his nearest and dearest. And the chain of command timing signals today are being directed by General Joseph Dunford who was unwise enough to help or be the guest of honor at a Marine summit, which I find oxymoronic is the wrong word. Why would you take the most prestigious armed force responsible for the security of the president of the United States, presumably whose deployment is a matter of utmost secrecy and put him in a hotel that is associated or appears to be associated with a snuff film betting ring. So it's 12.32, Phil, what would you like to do now? Well, along with what you just said, uh, you, why would you want to put your best and brightest in harm's way? Uh, if one were to believe that there were five Special Forces graduates at Annapolis in 1971, none of the five knowing who the other four were and only finding out upon the death of any because they're mutually insured in a tontine, T-O-N-T-I-N-E, uh, would one believe that the first one killed would be a U.S. Navy SEAL named Alfred Albert Schaffelberger Jr. Uh, he was a SEAL that was assassinated in uh, San Salvador, El Salvador, or somewhere down there. His father was a Navy fighter pilot. Uh, he was in my class at Annapolis, and he was the first special ops victim. And the reason that four other people knew that he was special ops would have been when their, when their uh, balance in their tontine reflected uh, 25% instead of 20%. 100 divided by 5 is 20. 100 divided by 4 is 25. And the, of the four people that remained after Schaffelberger was taken out, uh, 
three of the other four found out on the morning of 9-11 that Chick Burlingame was one of the five uh, because their balance in their tontine, and notice I didn't say anything about USAA insurance, um, the balance went from 25% to 33%. And uh, if I were a complete idiot, I'd tell you what the balance is today, David, over to you. And regarding what I want to do, who cares? Uh, yeah, Shaplin, who did that so? Swamp, that's great. That was quick because I was talking fast. Yeah, there you go. The guy standing there with a utility cap and chrome sunglasses, um, that is Al Albert Schaffelberger Jr. His father was a Marine, excuse me, Navy fighter pilot. Uh, he was a U.S. Navy SEAL. And I do believe that the class of 1971 or 70, it was one of those two classes, was the first year that people could directly, or they could go from the Naval Academy directly into the SEALs. And of course, you don't get into the SEALs without qualifying, so you'd have to go to some rigorous training, which brings us back to Extortion 17. As of the time that uh, Special Operations Chief Aaron Carson Vaughn graduated from SEAL training, he was the only SEAL ever to pass every test on the first try. No other SEAL in history had done that before Aaron Carson Vaughn did it. So what was Aaron Carson Vaughn's reward? Well, Barry Swatero, uh, Leon Panetta, and Martin Dempsey, and two insignificant pissants authorized the hit on this helicopter. But you know, it really doesn't matter because when they took down that helicopter, oh, which reminds me, David, I don't know if you looked at the radio show ad, but I think the second, in fact, would somebody check and see if it's the second, third, fourth or first pitcher. There's a pitcher of what's left of a helicopter that crashed and it's burning. And that was flown by a Vietnam era guy um, like my age. And that was a life flight. That's not what they call it, but it's something similar to that. Uh, that was, I forgot the name of the town in Colorado. It just crashed about a week or 10 days ago. Ah, the guy that was flying it was Pat Mahaney, M-A-H-A-N-Y. How do I know it was Pat Mahaney and that he was a Vietnam era helicopter pilot? Well, I don't know. How did I know that Albert, Alfred Schaffelberger and Chick Burlingame were special operatives? Uh, in the case of Chick Burlingame, uh, he worked directly for a Brigadier General Paul Knox at the Pentagon and he was in charge of war game planning and Chick Burlingame is the one who planned the war game for 9-11. So what'd they do to him? They killed him. Guess what? Too late to kill me, because uh, Proverbs 16.9, I'm not doing what I'm doing on my plans. I'm doing it because I've been deployed. David, whenever you want to quit, we can call for the big red button. Okay, I just read a little bit from the letter of Mark presented on the internet from of James Madison. Letter of Mark, James Madison, President of the United States of America. To all who shall see these presents, greetings, be it known that in pursuance of an act of Congress passed on the fifth day, June, 1812, I have commissioned and by these presents do commission the private armed schooner called the Lucy of the burden of 25 tons or thereabouts owned by John Lawton of the city of Taunton, state of Massachusetts to da 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 subdue, seize and take any armed or unarmed British vessel, public or private, which shall be found within the Da, 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 United States. Anyway, it's a nice document. It's got a seal on it, I see, by the president. And James Monroe, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is Secretary of State. So back in 1812, when the British and the Americans were battling with each other and the British sacked Washington, leaving the patent office standing, we have a letter of patent from the president, James Madison. And my guess is that the Brits being the Brits, they will have their letters patent as well to punish various parties in the United States for their crimes dating back to the War of Independence. 
Now, it may very well be the letters of Mark in the United Kingdom are covert and issued by the uh, Treasury solicitor for their eyes only, but James Madison came out with it. So I think, just going back over what you said earlier, you are the best informed Marine in the United States of America, Phil. You've got a more resourceful intelligence network. You're older and senior to these characters, and you are a private citizen at the moment. So I was just toying with the idea in my imagination, maybe Craig could do a magnificent collage, as to what vessel you should start arresting or confiscating the assets of Serco in the United States. And I thought one of your limos would be very appropriate. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Well, one of my limos is down at Kent's Garage getting uh, worked on right now. Uh, I won't tell you what's being done to it. Are you saying I should take a recognizable vehicle and uh, take some Serco stuff with a letter of market reprisal? Yeah, totally. In, in Washington, D.C., you know where its headquarters office are? Yeah, are aren't they in Chantilly? Or, wait, uh, wait a minute, we don't have to do this. Uh, where, are, where is the Circo office in Northern Virginia? Watch how fast our chat room will put it up. We don't have to punish ourselves mentally, but if I were going to take uh, something in the United Kingdom, I'd take that clock and I'd take one of their uh, Royal Navy uh, vessels. Do you have any idea which Royal Navy ship would be the most astute to capture? I think I do. What? <laughs> it's uh, HQCS Wellington in the Thames. No, maybe I mean, you might be right. That's not what I was thinking of. Um, there's a Royal Navy ship called the Hermit. It's probably HMS Ambush. And since they ambushed us on 9-11, and since payback is an m effort, there's ladies present. And you know what? Let's cover that right now. I respect ladies and I respect women, and uh, they're one and the same often. And then there's women, huh, that's an abuse of the population of women. There are alleged females such as Hillary Clinton and my sister, Christine Marcy, that are so repugnant uh, that I don't respect them at all, but I do what I've been called to do in Ephesians 5.11, which is expose them, which makes me an exposure artist as well as a cunning linguist. And David, as long as you made the comment that you think I'm probably the most well-informed Marine in the United States of America, that is basically the salient thrust, I say again, thrust of your comment, was it not? Yes. Yeah, I agree with you. And if there's anyone out there in the Marine Corps Active Retired uh, Reserve that thinks they know more, I would love to meet you and I'd love to have a moderated discussion with a camera going for about one hour and uh, 31 minutes. David, I'm going to select randomly a mix drop from Cavendish and Harvey, and I'm going to put it on my tongue on the count of three. Shouldn't have waited, David, because when you're going to go into a gunfight, you don't tell them you're going to shoot on three. You shoot them as fast as you can and get it over with. David, over to you. Okay, Phil, so what I've done is I've put a picture of the headquarters office of Serco in Reston, Virginia, in the lobby, presumably, and I just think it would be absolutely beyond hilarious if you arrive in your limo with some retired or veterans uh, from the Marine Corps, perhaps ones you know, and you go in there and, um, you know, provided you have your letters of mark and reprisal, you arrest the managing director or whatever passes as uh, the chief there. But one of the people that presumably works out of that office is Maureen Baginski. So it's always best to personalize it, I think. Oh, yeah. Right? Okay. So you, you, I, you secure from whoever issues this letters of Mark a specific name to arrest and detain Maureen Baginski because... Remember, she did some very interesting things. She was, a, I think, a founder member or certainly a contemporary of Christine Marcy in the senior executive service back in 79. She had a 25-year career with the National Security Administration. 
she was parachuted into the FBI to continue what your sister started after 911 with the transformation of the FBI from solving crime to preventing acts of terror. She would have been a party or a user of the Circo Onion Router system. And after leaving uh, the FBI, having manipulated the intelligence system of the FBI, she becomes vice president of Circo in the United States with special responsibilities for as national security advisor. So presumably she was hobnobbing, although that conjures up some very nasty images, with Marine General or ex-Marine General Jim Jones. So what do you think they dreamt up? Well, I think they dreamt up these, um, how shall I put it, honeypots for online assassination betting for the donors to the Clinton Foundation, which probably explain the attacks in Mumbai on Thanksgiving Day, and all of these bizarre things where lone gunmen wander around full of opioids or anti-opioids, and they cut loose on victims, which allow these characters to blame the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male um, for basically being radical right-wing revolutionaries that need to be put down. But I digress. Over to you, Phil. I'm trying to remember what the last Tuesday in July is. And let me do the math. Um, I think Tuesday the 28th is the last Tuesday in July. Uh, and there's a reason why I'm asking that. Uh, and I, uh, hang on, I can't do two things at once, David. But there we go. Uh, I decided that if I go to, oh, you didn't see it because you're, you're not watching the video. But when you were talking about I should go out to uh, rest in Virginia and demand something gets turned over to me, I think the appropriate yeah, vehicle. Warren Baginski. Yeah, well, I think the appropriate vehicle would not be the purple limo. But put your thinking cap on, David. I'll never answer you. I'll never ask you a question that you can't answer if you just relax instead of think. What would a more fitting vehicle be than a limousine? And it's a vehicle that I currently own. A uh hearse. -huh. Yes, I think that's. I think that my hearse. Um, I'd like to make the offer to three families that if their fragile health family members succumb before 25 September, I'll drive the I'll I'll drive the stiff around in my own hearse at my own expense. All they have to do is admit that they're Nazis. David, over to you. Yeah, and I think you could put on the side, perhaps. I mean, waiting for the. Uh, letter of mark and reprisal, why don't we write our own and get it um, on both sides of your hearse, uh, identifying the people we're going after, and all devices in the network uh, time protocol clock uh, that are in the custody of Circo's aliens, and you can drive around with uh, that flaunted in front of their faces. What do you think? I think that'd be great. I do have a reason why I might need to be in Annapolis either in September or October, and you know, it's that uh, hearse only has 19,000 miles on it, and I'm sure I'll be dead, and I'm not being morbid, I'm just being realistic, because I'm fairly gifted at mathematics, not as much as David. But if I put an average of 3,000 miles a year on that car, uh, 3,000 miles a year times 20 years, 60,000, the car will only have 79,000 <coughs> when I kick the bucket at age 85. Now, the, the IRS tells me that I'll kick the bucket when I'm 83 to 85 due to their whatever their, uh, they call, there's a name for that. Uh, there's a type of an index where they can predict when you're going to croak. Uh, but see, those tables are all set on no vaccines. And people that are trying to reduce the world population from 7 billion to 500 million, uh, they probably think that some of us are going to allow vaccines to be forced into our body. You know, humans have been around since creation. And if we didn't need the vaccines way back then, we don't need the vaccines now. I have everything naturally that I need, including Cavendish and, Har Cavendish and Harvey, 
mixed fruit drops. Uh, I don't need a doctor. I don't need vaccines. I have the great physician. David, when do you want to call for the, uh, I, I'm not suggesting we end, but whenever you want to call for the red button, you do it, not me. Uh, okay. Um, I've just uh, put in the chat room a little bit of a uh, blurb about the recently renovated Sheraton Pentagon City Hotel. And I really want, or I'd like to encourage America to get mad at this because this hotel is the perfect location for a man in the middle attack, as we witnessed on the 911, where the Pentagon lost its U.S. Navy command center and Captain General De Conto died. What intrigues me is the address, the official address of that hotel is in Arlington. Right. So, again, if you're thinking strategically of where to place a hotel, and entrap its guests in to engage in man in the middle attacks on the United States of America. Why not kitty corner to the Arlington Cemetery where the great heroes and many unsung victims of the world wars are buried and use that base as a false flag to attack America. So we're permanently wondering is, did the Marines have any role in the attack of 911? And of course, 99.999% of the Marines didn't. But the mere fact that their chain of command has been backdoored with timing signals coming from the enemy of the United States as declared in 1812, and of course the technology then was very different from the technology now, but it still works on the same principles of time, because in 1812, the Royal Navy probably had access to the most accurate clocks in the world, which were the evolutionary technologies pioneered by John Harrison with his marine chronometer that went on a trip from Bristol to the West Indies and back, I think it was a four month, a month or a six week journey and lost five seconds. So I think I'm done field and um, ready to call it a day when you are. Oh, well then you just have, let's see if Mensa Max is here. Um, let's see, is Mensa Max here? Mensa, Max, Mensa Max is here, but I'm not sure he's listening. Um, but anyway, the following people have the authority to put up the red or green button and I'll honor it when I see it. Sherry T. in San Antonio, Afterburner in Brighton, England, Alicia in Los Angeles, or Mensa Max in Phoenix. Ready, set, go. And even when I turn it off, I'm going to stay in the chat room because uh, somebody asked me the drive distance and drive time from 918 Unavetter uh, Road in Canton, Georgia up to 401 Main Street, there's the big red button, although Linda wasn't one of the ones I named, I don't think, but who cares what's in the name. So if you want to say anything before the buttons push, you're going to have to talk quick, David. Okay, stay connected with the two dual line telephones and wireless high speed internet access in each room. We look forward